This is part two of my solar powered self-driving boat project called Gumption Trap. Part one already covers all the building and design and testing, so check that out if you're interested. But the main upgrade to this video is the sonar depth measuring module, so it'll autonomously drive around and create a three-dimensional depth plot as it goes. This is a Blue Robotics Ping sonar echo sounder. It costs more than the rest of the boat combined by quite a bit but I found it to be really repeatable and reliable, easily interfaces with Arduino with their uh, library for it. So I was really happy with how that turned out. I designed the sonar mount such that it hangs down about as low as it possibly can without touching the floor when the boat is at rest upright on a flat surface like this, resting on the prop shrouds and on the front nose cones. The only major physical changes since the last video were the addition of these nose cones that's just to try to reduce drag a little bit. Similarly, I've improved the shroud mounts quite a bit. They're a lot stronger now, and they're an angled surface instead of a flat plane, so that'll hopefully help reduce drag a little bit too. Also added a few small feet so that I can set it down upside down without worrying about the surface scratching the solar panel, and they're short enough that they don't cast a shadow on it. And also I've got a whole lot of improvements to the electronics and the code. This is my old main board compared to the new one. It's quite a bit more organized on this custom PCB. Saves me this whole rat's nest. It's mostly the same components, except the microcontroller has been upgraded to a Teensy 4.0. I've added a different SD module. Uh, that's because this one needs to work at three volt logic level. Um, I've added these two power sensors, one's for the power output and one's the power in from the solar panel. That'll detect the voltage and the current throughput. I squared C expansion module. So I'll hook up my compass to that and possibly some other future additions. Uh, three volt, three V three voltage regulators and some small capacitors to go with them. Those power the GPS the power sensors and the I squared C as well as potentially some other expansion stuff uh, and some of the same connectors for the ESCs, the same radio module. This connector is a serial output. And lastly, I broke out all the unused pins on the microcontroller as well as an extra ground 3v3 and five volt pin just to make it easy to expand this in the future. And just a printed base for Velcroing it down. That's what the bare one looks like for reference. This is the schematic I made for the PCB using Autodesk Eagle. And uh, I know it's not the prettiest thing ever. You'll have to excuse the fact that I'm a mechanical engineer who only recently learned PCB design. Here's my board layout. It's a fairly straightforward two layer PCB and it's all through hole just to make all the soldering super easy. Um, I'd like to make another iteration of this at some point, um, just to kind of organize it a little better. Uh, it gets a little clutter down in this area with the voltage regulation. And I'd also like to add a better four pin connector for my sonar module. That was a little bit of an afterthought. Um, it just uses this serial connector and then it takes five volt off of my extra breakout pins. A final update on a few things I changed in the wiring. Um, I've added this switch coming right off of the load connection to the solar charger. That's just an easier way to turn it on and off. Previously, I was just disconnecting it here, which was a little bit of a pain. For the two power modules, one of them is in series with the load output, the positive high side, and the other one is in series with the solar panel input. So that's how I measure my current draw and the current coming from the panels. This cable is coming from the sonar module. I had to drill right through that PLA mount for this box. That was really the only convenient spot I could put it. Uh, I do anticipate the possibility of a little bit of water seeping through the PLA, which isn't totally watertight, uh, but this is above the water line, so that shouldn't be a problem unless it were submerged. Uh, it just has a few DuPont connections. At some point, I'd like to replace all these with uh, 
a little bit of a more reliable connect connector because I found these to be a little bit iffy sometimes, especially in high vibration environments. So that's using the extra serial connection that I put on the PCB. And then the other two wires are just a five volt source coming off of that breakout. Otherwise, everything's hooked up the same way as it was in the last video. Just testing the new PCB inside the vehicle, making sure everything still works. And the only other thing that I don't think made it on screen in the last video is that I ended up swapping the solar charge controller for this Genesun GV5. This is the path I plotted for my first depth mapping test. It's a little bit arbitrary with this zigzag pattern, but I'm still kind of testing all the navigation stuff and I wanted to have more turns than just a straight back and forth type of path. I literally just uh, used Google Maps and clicked on some points, took their GPS coordinates, put it in my SD card as a CSV and plugged that into the boat and it follows the path based on the GPS coordinates and the compass. You'll notice in the time-lapse video, there's actually a bug in the code that it ran on where on these right turns, instead of making a relatively easy left, it goes like the long way around to the right. For example, instead of taking a 60 degree turn left, it would take a 300 degree turn right. Um, I've since fixed that in the code, but just wanted to explain why it's doing that in that video. So this is a full speed, real time recording of the boat coming into the shore at the end of its mission. As you can tell, it's a little bit slow. The thrust is a little underpowered. I could improve that quite a bit, I'm sure, by uh, adding some more efficient propellers. They would get more thrust out of the same input power. Because um, as it is, it has a little bit of difficulty overcoming a strong breeze, but it's great for a nice calm pond like this. So now we'll go into some time-lapse video and some shots from the onboard camera in the front of the boat. This is the raw depth data that I recorded off of the SD card and plugged into MATLAB to create this plot. The color is the depth, so the yellow is essentially zero, dark purple is nine meters, so the deepest points that it measured, over here it measured two points at close to nine meters, around 25 feet or so, and it was shallow, close to zero over where it started, came across a shallow patch near the center that it measured a bunch of points at another kind of shallow point over here. Um, the individual black dots are all the depth measurements. This line is the GPS recording data. And of course this surface 
is an approximation based on all the points it collected. So like way out here, that's unreliable, low confidence because it didn't measure any points out there. Similarly with this corner, the actual shape of the lake is more along with the outline of where the path is. This is a really cool 3D representation of that same plot within MATLAB that I can rotate around and look at the contours of the bottom that it measured. So these are the deepest two points. This is the starting point over here. That's the shore where it began, which is the highest up point, close to zero. Found a shallow area in this region, and then kind of a valley through here, and a couple deep points over there. It's really cool to see this represented in three dimensions. Here's a comparison of the planned path to the actual measured path. Obviously there's a little bit of weirdness caused by these loop-de-loops, and I'll discuss why that bug occurred, but for the most part it followed the path pretty well. Did a great job maintaining the straight lines without going all uh, back and forth or without being underdamped, so that worked out pretty well. Another big cause of the distortion and the different path you see is that each of these turns, each of the points on this plot, are the waypoints that I set for my boat to follow, and they have uh, an acceptable range to where it considers it close enough and it starts moving to the next waypoint. And so during this mission I had that set to 50 feet more or less, which is maybe a little bit excessive. So these long straightaways probably were not quite as long in real life because it got to within 50 feet and then just started moving towards the next one. So you might notice some of the turns are a little wider, some of the straights are a little shorter. Um, I did that in practice because I wasn't totally sure how well it would be able to hit a waypoint perfectly, and its turning radius isn't great, so I was worried it would kind of end up orbiting a waypoint without being able to reach it. Um, but in practice I could definitely tighten that down quite a bit after seeing how it performed. Here's the depth plot scaled to more or less match a satellite image of the pond. Kind of interestingly, this light patch visible on the satellite coincides with this big shallow area the depth plot measured. And there's also, I don't know if you can tell, a couple other minor light patches that kind of coincide with this. Down here is the dock where I launched it from and where it ended. So that's where this couple of points of really shallow patch is as well. And then the deepest points were roughly in this region here, around 25 feet or so. It records a black box of a few key parameters as it goes with a sampling rate of about once per second, and it outputs it to this CSV type file like this. Over here is the time since startup in seconds. This is the mode, one being auto, zero manual, GPS, compass heading, these are, that's the current waypoint it's trying to get to. The throttle of both motors, left and right, shows when it dips, when it's increased, and then current and voltage measurements from both of the power sensors. It also outputs a similar file that's dedicated only to GPS coordinates and depth measurements. This one's at a much lower sampling rate of about once per 30 seconds, and that's just so that I don't overwhelm my plotting code with a ridiculous amount of points. The last file it outputs is an error log with timestamps, um, and there's a bunch of different errors that can occur. This was actually happening erroneously, it was giving that error every 10 seconds, even though it actually was getting good GPS signals. On the initial startup, it takes a minute to acquire a signal, so it gives that GPS lost error. Low sonar confidence, that's when I had it out of the water, just sitting in air, and it wasn't giving good sonar measurements, so that gave that error towards the beginning and a few more times at the end when I pulled it out. This is really just for troubleshooting purposes. If something weird happens, I'll know a timestamp and have an idea of maybe what might have gone wrong with my navigation or power or anything like that. Here's a few quick Excel plots I whipped up out of the black box data that I thought were interesting. This one's the steering of both motors over time, the left throttle and the right throttle, with uh, 180 being full, zero being no throttle. You'll notice that the right motor drops to zero a lot more than the left motor, and that's going to be because of the bug I'm discussing 
that uh, it takes the long way around to the right instead of a shorter left turn. Also, kind of interestingly, these points where it drops to around 140 or so, those are where it's making the minor corrections during the straightaways. It doesn't drop to any greater values than that because there's kind of a grace period programmed in to where it won't alter its steering unless it exceeds the target heading by more than 10 degrees. So if I tightened that, we'd see more minor steering adjustments. And I may do that just to improve its efficiency a little bit, keep it closer to full throttle for more of the time. This is the current draw. You'll notice a few big downward spikes that coincide with steering when one motor is off and it's making a sharp turn. During full throttle periods, it averaged around 2.5 amps. Um, there's a maximum current draw, a maximum nominal of about 5 amps before the solar charge controller cuts it off for safety. So really I could increase the throttle limit a little without getting too close to that. Um, the dangerous parts are these few spikes here. If it exceeds 5 amps, closer to 6 in practice, it'll cut the power completely and that's kind of a catastrophic failure. So I kept the throttle limited to 40% to keep the current draw down a little, um, but that'll hopefully be improved with propeller efficiency and some other changes. This is the compass heading over time. Uh, keep in mind when it gets to 360, it loops back around to zero. These are the big long way around right turns, and these are the more efficient turns on the way back. This is the main voltage coming off of the battery voltage. There, there are some dips and bumps where the motors kick on and off and the back EMF causes a little spike, but you do notice it kind of gradually decreases over time as the battery power drains. And this is the solar panel output. It was around six o'clock in the evening, close to sunset when I filmed this on a cloudy winter day. So we were not getting much out of the solar panel, only around 30 amps, excuse me, 30 milliamps towards the peak. But kind of interestingly, it smoothly went up and down, I guess as clouds passed by or maybe the boat transitioned into a shadow. I will upload a copy of the code somewhere for you to check out, so I'm not going to go into a ton of detail with it on video, but there are a few points I want to hit. Um, in the main setup loop, it's just some typical initialization stuff. The main loop, uh, there's just a few functions for each of the main things that it does. Checks if it should be in auto or manual mode, reads the power sensors, reads the echo sounder for depth. Uh, that just outputs some value, values to the serial uh, if it's plugged into a PC for troubleshooting. That records the black box data, that records the depth log data, and this takes the GPS and compass headings, and then it either runs in auto mode or manual mode. So in auto mode, the bug that it previously had is that it was missing these two lines. I added that code for left turns. If the difference between its current heading and its goal heading is more than 180, it'll subtract 360 degrees, so it goes the short way around instead of the long way around. But I was missing this, the inverse of that. If the difference between the goal and the current heading is less than negative 180, it should be adding 360 degrees. So then it just maps those uh, values from the heading difference to motor throttles and it writes that to the motors, um, checks the distance between its current location and the waypoint goal, and then that's how it decides if it should move on to the next waypoint or not. This is where I'm logging the errors, uh, just to switch to print different things to the SD card depending on different things that might trigger error codes. Uh, and this is the black box logging, just of all these different kind of critical values that I'd like to see. And this logs the depth data, uh, just some different variables. This is all the code for the depth log. Uh, this library for the Blue Robotics ping is pretty easy to use. That's not too complicated. Manual mode is pretty similar to auto mode, except it's doing that based off of the signal it gets from the uh, transmitter. A um, few random functions here and there. Uh, the navigation just checks the GPS coordinates and the magnetometer for the compass heading. Uh, this is just the pinout. 
and that's where it measures all the current and voltage stuff. One of the things I'd like to improve in the code is to have more of the error conditions actually do stuff besides just writing an error. Um, so for example, the power sense error, if it detects the current is over the limit, it will cut the throttle to both motors, log the error, and then pause for a moment. Um, but most of the errors don't actually do anything except write the error. For example, I could have this error three where it is unable to reach its target heading. If that's the case, maybe I could have it increase the steering gain, which is this 5x multiplier right here, um, in case maybe it's in a strong wind and it can't overcome into the turn. One last thing that has been slightly annoying me is this smart delay function. It is required for the GPS to actually update, otherwise I don't get good GPS data. And it is a holding function, so the code waits 100 milliseconds every time this is called, which means that at most it really updates things about 10 times per second, which is really fine for what I'm doing. It's not that big of a deal, um, but it certainly could be improved if I could find a better way to do this. Um, what's important here is that it's reading the hardware serial that the GPS is wired into, and it's encoding that data. If this doesn't get done, the GPS doesn't update. I'll end the video with a couple of things I'd like to improve and some future ideas for this project. I think the main limiting factor right now is the propellers. They're pretty rough and they're far from a efficiency optimized design. I'd really like to try out these toroidal propellers I've been reading so much about and see if I can get some good efficiency out of them. Um, I'm getting a resin printer soon, so maybe I'll be able to print some things with much better surface finish and smoothness. I know that'll help a lot. I'd also like to replace these PVC pontoons with either some type of closed cell foam or maybe even fiberglass pontoons, because these are really heavy for the amount of buoyancy they provide, and these big blunt faces are not great for drag, so overall there's definitely room for improvement there. Um, and another cool idea that I had would be to maybe put a few small servos in the corners of the solar panel so that every maybe once a minute, every couple of minutes, I could tilt it and adjust the angle to point it towards the sun. That would definitely improve the solar current output, um, especially towards the evening or mornings, because I'd really like to go on some long term, long range missions with this to plot bigger bodies of water. Um, I'd also like to add in a better radio that can transmit data back to a base station so I can check on it as it goes. Right now I have no way of stopping it unless it's within about 30 feet of uh, the transmitter. The antennas being on the bottom of this box, basically in the water, it doesn't have a very good signal range and it can't transmit data back. So that would be cool to do. Um, but other than that, those are my future plans and I'll have some more information, BOM, link to the code, uh, link to the PCB design, all that stuff somewhere in a description. So check that out and thank you for watching.